Happy Wednesday, everybody. Uh, I did promise information about the final project today, so uh, I will do that. Though I, I didn't get to actually posting a document that will be up later today with uh, kind of a written version of what I'm about to tell you. Uh, but to kind of important dates. Uh, Uh, the proposal for the final project, I believe, that's on the calendar for next Tuesday. Uh, and this is going to propose uh, some significant extension of OSC. Fort Smart. Uh, you're saying it's not next Tuesday? Um, yeah, I think so. Next Tuesday. Uh, no, sorry. Uh, it's, yeah, it's the the week after Lab Five is due. So next, next Tuesday. <laughs> so yeah, uh, Tuesday, March first. Okay. I had a week off my uh, Yeah, so some significant extension of OSV. Uh, some examples, and the, the document I'll put up will, will have these uh, kind of examples of things you could do. You could implement a user thread library. So basically, uh, entirely in user space, uh, give the user uh, function to create new threads, to wait for threads, um, and you would also need to implement a scheduler for these threads. So you'd be kind of creating a, a, a data structures and, and a scheduler for kind of user space uh, threads. Kernel thread management would be another good final project. So right now, every process gets one kernel thread when it's created, and that's it. Uh, but the processes are set up with a list of threads. Uh, so there could, in theory, be multiple kernel threads for a process. And so you might provide a system call for the user to say, for a process, say, give me another kernel thread uh, and implement support for that. Um, we talked about yesterday how for virtual memory you might want to swap pages of memory out to disk. That currently does not exist in OSV, so you could implement that feature of virtual memory. That would be an, an excellent final project. <clears throat> You could also just identify useful or interesting system calls, maybe ones that Linux has, maybe memory map files, for example, that OSV doesn't currently have. And you would just like pick a set of five or so system calls, maybe more or fewer, depending on how involved they are, uh, to, to implement. This is not an exhaustive list, uh, but these are kind of the, the kind of thing that you might propose for a project. Uh, the proposal will be similar to a design document, uh, except I'm not expecting you to have a bunch of like implementation detail in the proposal. You're sort of outlining the project, you're analyzing like what are risks, what are unknowns. Uh, an important thing that will need to be in the proposal is I will expect you to have sought out and located at least three kind of sources about whatever thing you're implementing that you can uh, refer to as you go through implementation. And in the documental post, I'll point to some places to look uh, for this kind of information. On uh, the other, uh, so it'd be like this, uh, by, by sources, I mean like this documentation for like this part of the Linux kernel or this chapter from this book about this uh, te an operate, uh, like teaching operating system like OSV, like things like this that you 
uh, can or like blog posts or whatever it is, kind of things that that you can um, uh, use. And then uh, the last thing is you mean to get the bit back? Yeah, I think you know the cover. You will be responsible for implementing test cases to demonstrate the correctness uh, of whatever feature you implement. Um, so you will both be implementing some feature as well as tests to demonstrate that it works. Uh, and besides the proposal, uh, the only other deadline is you will need to have submitted. Um, uh, uh, and this will be on on Moodle um, uh, or uh, yeah probably uh, probably on Gradescope actually because that will be easier to submit from GitHub. But uh, March sixteenth, end of finals, nine p.m. That's the the final deadline for submitting the code. Uh, you won't need to submit a separate design document with implementation detail separate from the proposal, but I would encourage you to do one. I think it will. Well, it will definitely make the implementation uh, easier. Any questions on the, the final part of stuff? Yeah. Okay, so for the test cases, they go, go with the proposal. Uh, you do not have to have these in the proposal. I was just mentioning this is a this is a required part of the of the trip. Uh, you will be expected to implement test cases, but no, you you don't need to have like come up with them. Uh, and I, I haven't, there will be a specific number that you require to implement, I just haven't. It will be like five or six or something like that. So. If we wanted to we do something more ambitious but less, like, between, like, with less strict criteria, like, if we wanted to, like, do some, like, bare bones version of some, like, very complex feature, like, like security management or something? Uh, yeah, absolutely. This is, this is wide open. I'm happy for you to, to propose kind of whatever it is you um, and yeah, if there's some kind of, uh, if there's some like thing that you're interested in uh, that's like in a real, uh, used in real kernels, um, like you don't have to propose to implement like 100% of the kind of state of the art thing. I can be here. Here's the big thing, and I'm gonna kind of work through the different parts of it in this order, for example. Other questions? Just to clarify, the sources are part of the proposal. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So the um, yeah the documental post will will spell out exactly what's in the proposal versus in the final code. All right. So uh, before moving on to a new topic for today, uh, I want to kind of finish up with our discussion of virtual memory uh, because what we didn't get to last time was uh, what we should do We need to replace some page of physical memory. And uh, if we're in real dire straits, maybe we're completely out of physical memory. We don't have any free pages. More likely, we have limited each process to a certain number of physical pages. And when it needs another one, it will replace, will replace one of the pages being used by that process, if it's at this limit of how many, how many pages it can use. Um, but when we need, when we hit some point where we need to replace a page, uh, we need a replacement policy, some sort of uh, set of rules or procedure to decide which page we're going to replace, which one uh, we're going to evict, uh, and write out to disk if we need to, uh, then, then we can replace. So. Uh, we're going to think about uh, five different possible policies. Um, one very simple one, just choose randomly. Choose a random page, get rid of it, 
Um, there are some cases where we might actually want to do this. Uh, for example, if we're dealing with an L1 cache where the speed of access is the most critical thing. Like the whole point of L1 caches is that accessing this cache is as close to just executing a single CPU instruction as we can get. Uh, and so we want a replacement policy that is going to be the uh, minimal possible overhead. And in that case, just choosing something random uh, instead of trying to do some sort of complex decision or keeping track of some extra data about what's in the cache to help us decide. Just using something random uh, uh, that uh, that could be could be helpful. So we need it to be fast. And also in the case of L1 cache, the cost of randomly choosing a like a bad thing that we we actually need to bring back into the cache soon after. Uh, that's fairly small relative to maybe uh, sending a page all the way out to disk. Um, so random we'll use in, in some uh, some circumstances it avoids any overhead uh, and it's unlikely to make the worst possible choice. Also unlikely to make the best uh, but as we'll see uh, some seemingly smarter algorithms will, under some circumstances, just consistently make the worst choice. Um, and random won't do that, on average at least. However, if a programmer wants to do any sort of optimization based on knowledge of, of caches, this is totally unpredictable. You just you can't assume that something you, that gets brought into the cache is going to stay there because it's random. Uh, so there, there's benefits. Um, Another way is let's just have the pages in memory form a nice orderly line and have them uh, leave memory kind of in the order that they came into memory. So, so the, the first page that we uh, brought into, into memory is also the first page we kick out once we need a new spot. So uh, this is just treating uh, our pages as a queue with uh, first in, first out behavior. We're always evicting the oldest one. One perhaps kind of intuitive approach, particularly because when memory is treated as a cache for the disk, if pages are still being used by the program, we might want to try and do something where we get rid of the one that's no longer being used on the assumption that maybe the program is done with it. Uh, and it's OK for us to remove it. We're, we're not going to immediately get some uh, a page fault and have to bring it back in. Um, uh, so uh, least recently used, pretty, pretty common in caches in, in general, and one of the policies we'll consider. Uh, the other one. I want to mention, which I'll label min, which is kind of this stand in for what would the optimal policy be? Uh, and in that case, we're going to replace the page. Like optimal would be to somehow know which page is going to be used again farthest in the future, which may be never, and replace that one. This is kind of a stand-in for the optimal policy. In general, there would be no way to know this information. Like we don't have any way to uh, know all future memory accesses that a program is going to make. And so we couldn't possibly uh, uh, know in general kind of which page won't be used for the longest time and thus sort of optimally 
stacks of things we should get rid of. The intuition for why this would be the optimal is uh, if we replaced any other page than the one that would be used farthest in the future, we get a page fault earlier than if we replace the one that would be used farthest in the future. With me so far? Any questions on these inequalities, Jim? Okay, so the, for for the min, like when when this page will be used like farthest in the future? This is like um, the programmer's decision, right? Is this something that programmer said? Oh, okay, this page. This page. Uh, no, this is based on hypothetical knowledge. Like, if we knew somehow all the memory accesses that a program would make, then we could determine like which is the optimal page to get rid of. Uh, and this is sort of this. Um, you might think of it as as an upper bound. So this is if we had a perfect policy, it would be as good as this policy. But this min policy is hypothetical. Because we're not actually in practice going to be able to have the information it depends on. So it's sort of when we're thinking about how good are these different options, we can compare them to this sort of hypothetical optimal outcome. Other questions? All right, so I'm going to ask you. to uh, work through what some of these different policies would do uh, in the following way. So I'm going to say we have spots for four pages. And we're going to have the uh, uh, access. And so these, these pages here are our Physical pages. We have four physical pages. And then we have our virtual pages. We have five of them that I'll call A, B, C, D, E. And then we have accesses to pages in the following order. We have A, B, A, C, B, B, A, D, E, D, A, E. And if I'm uh, working through this, I say, okay. My four physical pages start empty. There's an access to A. So I'm going to put A in uh, physical page one. Access to B. B is not in, it does not have a physical page. I'll put it in here. And access to A, I'd say that's a hit because A is already in. Uh, physical memory. And I can kind of work through this pattern of accesses and using these different policies determine what each one would do at each of these steps. So when all four physical pages are full and I have access C and D and E and then when I access E here all four physical pages will be full, and these different policies would indicate which page should E replace. So, I'd like you to work with the folks around you to figure out what would FIFO, LRU, and MIN each do for this set of accesses. Uh, I will Add a few more on here. BAC. So uh, take uh, uh, five or eight minutes or so and work through 
how many kind of hits and misses would you have under FIFO, under LRU, and then under min. We can actually implement min here because we are saying we know the full pattern of access, all the accesses that are going to occur. So for min, we can actually determine which one will be used farthest in the future. Okay. Uh, also consider a, the, what happens when we do a sequential scan. And we just go A, B, C, D, E, A, B, C, D, E, and so on. We're just like looping through these pages. So if you, you finish analyzing this one, take a look at this one. All right. Let's. Uh, Take a look at that, what these are are going to do. So if we have, uh, if we're using a, a FIFO replacement policy, uh, we end up with uh, bringing in C, B is a hit, we bring in D, A is in there, D is in there. All right, when we bring in E under FIFO, uh, which page would we, would we replace? Okay. Yeah, it's the, the earliest one in there, so E would go here. Under uh, least recently used, which page would we replace? Okay. Oh. Yeah. 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 Oh. yeah, if we, like, D has been used, A has been used, B has been used. So yeah, it does look like C is our what we get rid of in um, under LRU, and how about min? What what page would min replace at this point? Yeah, because we can look ahead and say, okay, C's are our final, uh, the, the furthest away, uh, so we would also see this. <laughs> there we go. Uh, uh, min replacing C as well. Uh, and uh, does LRU uh, ever differ from min in this circumstance? No. Uh, under this pattern, LRU is actually optimal. So, like replacing the least recently used one uh, is going to give us the as few uh, page faults as it is uh, possible to, to get. Questions, thoughts on that? All right, how about the sequential scan is, how does LRU do there? It misses every time. Yeah, we, we're looking at our sequential scan, A, B, uh, C, D and LRU says uh, when we uh, get to E, we would replace A, and then we see B again. Um, Don't we see A again? Oh, sorry. Yeah. We see we see A again. That's going to replace B, uh, and then C is going to replace uh, D. Uh, or, and so on. So like every single access, we're going to be kicking out uh, the one that we're about to need. So when we have the sequential scan, LRU, not only is it not optimal, it is pessimal. It is making the worst decision uh, at each point. Uh, anyone uh, notice a pattern in what min would do on a sequential scan? Uh, well, it's going to think like the thing before. What you have, so like if you're on a D, it's going to pick the C. It's going to cause one fourth of the time to evict something. Other people, it's going to find the C. Yeah, so <coughs> we evict the, the in fact, we, we would evict the thing that we used most recently. Uh, and so while it's counterintuitive, a most recently used policy is actually optimal for our sequential scan. Because we know as soon as we use some page, if we're just scanning through them in a loop, 
Uh, the one that we just used is the one that will be used farthest away in the future. So we're going to have to go through all other pages until we get back to it. So you might imagine some sophisticated system would uh, have some way of detecting uh, or annotating that a sequential scan was taking place uh, and would switch over to a most recently used policy in order to uh, improve the performance. Any other questions on these examples? All right, the uh, other policy that I will mention that sometimes comes up is least frequently used. Uh, and this, instead of going by kind of recency, the way the LRU does, uh, the frequently used relies on some information about how often certain pages or, or entries in a cache are, are used. And whichever one is just used very rarely, you say, well, that's probably a, a safer one to, to get rid of. So, all these policies are uh, are nice, but uh, what to to actually implement least recently used? Uh, like imagine you um, you're implementing the the, the page fault handler, uh, and you need to identify uh, a physical page to kind of write out to disk and reclaim. Uh, what information might you need to actually implement a, a least recently? You need some kind of list or data structure that's keeping track of all of the pages and then picking out the one that it was least recently used. So you need some kind of thing that's keeping track of everything. Exactly. Like a, a, a common way to, to implement uh, LRU behavior. Is we have some linked list of the pages, and on every access to a page, we then move that page to the front of the list, uh, and so. The LRU page would be the tail of the list. Uh, does this seem like a, a, a good solution? Is there any downside to this? Uh, well, this is pretty expensive. Like every time you have a page, you have to move to a whole list. That could be like, it's like almost like probably like double the time you can. Like, it's, it's just a lot of work. Aiden? Why can't we just store the tail value? Uh, if we store just the tail value, uh, we uh, and then we use the tail value. The tail value gets accessed. What should replace it? How do we know what the next least recently used thing would be? Sebastian, would you use a doubly linked list for that? Yes, this linked list would need to be would be. Be doubly linked, but because when when our least LRU page is accessed, we need to like update our like which one will be replaced to the next kind of least recently used. That's why we need a list of all the pages uh, so that we can kind of keep them in some ordered way, so that when we uh, market pages access, uh, we know what what becomes the tail. But I would agree with Owen that this is prohibitively expensive. That if we have to do a linked list manipulation on every single memory access, we've added huge overhead to uh, memory accesses. And memory was already uh, a, a bottleneck in many cases. Okay. Yeah, but I was thinking about the counter. 
Yeah, so we, we in practice, systems will approximate LRU. Like we could do the full LRU by keeping a counter on like every single page and incrementing it on every single, and incrementing all pages counters on every access and resetting it to zero and one is access so we can find the one with the highest counter. Um, but we really want some approximation that's going to uh, require uh, less work than this. Uh, so one tool that we can uh, make use of is just keep track of which pages are recently so we can divide pages into those that were recently used and those that have not been recently used. With the idea that among those that haven't been recently used, like it's probably not a much difference on average to replace one that hasn't been used in a while instead of another that hasn't been used in a while. That replacing precisely the least recently used maybe doesn't have, is it isn't worth the cost. Uh, so, if we have this use bit uh, that gets set by the hardware, it gets set by the hardware when we bring the page table entry into the TLB, then we can use something called The clock algorithm, and the idea here is that and kind of every so often, our clock algorithm goes through all the pages. Any that are unused, meaning any whose kind of reference count is zero, we can free those up, and at that time, reset the use bits. So uh, every so often, we're going through and resetting all the use bits, and so at any point, the use bits will, represent it, or will be set for those pages that were used since the last time this sort of swept through. Uh, I think the name comes from like the hand of a clock is like sweeping through all the pages is the, the metaphor here. So. Will it, so like after every however length of time, it'll go through all of the ones that have this use bit turned to like recently used and just turn it off. So theoretically, something could be just used and then the clock algorithm says, okay, now it's time to go do our check and the thing you just used would be set to, yeah, this is in, eight, okay, yeah. Yeah, so this is an approximation. Yeah, yeah. It's not it's not perfect. Turns out to be like a decent approximation yeah. in practice. This clock algorithm is, is a common solution to this. Uh, there's also something called nth chance, where you kind of count how many times, like the clock kind of increments some counter, um, uh, and the counter is reset on use. And then if it increments it to some threshold n, that's when we say, okay, this page. It's not been used in long enough that we're going to reclaim it. Oh. Is it clock algorithm? Is it true that when the clock algorithm goes, the ones that have not been used until the last are then thrown out, or are they still left in unused? Like, um, or is that like a design detail? Yeah, that, that would be an implementation detail. Like, uh, the idea would be to just kind of batch the actually reclaiming of unused pages to be done as this clock moves through. And then it's also manipulating this use bit so that if we're in a situation where every uh, where we don't have a free page that has been reclaimed to use, uh, we can uh, you approximate LRU by just replacing something that was not recently used. So this is kind of like rather than having a replacement policy, just avoid having to replace pages because you just get rid of uh, well, it's, it's also a way to approximate the LIU replacement policy by having this use bit mean this page has been used since the last time the clock ran, or it hasn't been used, in which case it's okay to replace it. Does that make sense? 
they use it like random to pick between the, the bunch of phases that haven't been recently used. Yeah, that would be an implementation detail. Um, I think random would be reasonable. Uh, you could, there are also schemes where you like take a page from the process that's using the most memory to find the fair about memory allocation. Or, yeah, there's a bunch of different ways you could kind of make a decision within that not be used. Other questions? All right. Today, I want to talk to you about William McKinley. Uh, we have our, our first uh, first president who uh, will be elected to two consecutive terms uh, since, uh, I think, uh, uh, Ulysses S. Grant after the Civil War. Uh, McKinley is a uh, um, Republican, uh, pro high tariff, pro business. Uh, his campaign is kind of uh, masterminded by uh, uh, this guy, Mark Hanna, a, a wealthy uh, businessman. He, uh, with his business connections and his own wealth, he, he funds uh, uh, McKinley's campaign, leading to uh, political cartoons like this one. Where we can see McKinley is pictured as being in the pocket of Mark Hanna. A little McKinley here uh, stuffed in, in Hanna's pocket. And McKinley's opponent uh, in uh, uh, 1896 is uh, Williams, William Jennings Bryan, um, a fiery uh, Midwestern populist uh, ad uh, advocating for. Uh, uh, silver coinage, and uh, Brian, not only is he McKinley's opponent in 1896, he's also McKinley's opponent for re-election in 1900. Uh, and these are not the only two times that Brian will run for president. Uh, he was uh, a major figure in democratic politics for a long time. Uh, in 1900, uh, his kind of platform was considered pretty kooky. Uh, at least by his, his critics, a kind of eclectic mix. And so we have this uh, Harper's Weekly where the Democratic platform is this strange chimera that he made it all by himself, this being Brian. Um, uh, and this was a kind of, uh, uh, there, there was a, a lot of, uh, I guess, US Im imperialism during uh, McKinley's tenure. Uh, the US fought the war with Spain annexed the Philippines, Guam, Puerto Rico, uh, occupied Cuba with the U.S. Army. Um, Hawaii was uh, uh, annexed in 1898. Uh, and uh, when McKinley ran for re-election, uh, he added the uh, kind of uh, aggressive, uh, well-known, um, uh, Republican uh, governor of New York who had also become famous for fighting in the Spanish-American War, Theodore Roosevelt, as his vice president. Uh, and this becomes relevant because at something called the Pan-American Exposition uh, in Buffalo, New York, McKinley was there greeting people. And uh, this man, Leon Cholgaj, walked up and shot McKinley. Um, uh, uh, <clears throat> and so McKinley uh, is another president who dies in office. And uh, at the time, Roosevelt was added to the ticket. Others in the Republican Party were like, this is a bad idea. This crazy person is like one heartbeat away from becoming president. Uh, and indeed, uh, Roosevelt did become president uh, in, I think, 1901, uh, and would take a, a very different approach than, than McKinley did. Uh, all right, that's our presidential facts for today. So, the, the, the new topic for today is we are going to kind of return to uh, some of the ideas we were discussing uh, about concurrency. 
kind of launch into our discussion uh, about memory uh, and uh, in part time with labs four and five to make sure uh, that we, we talked about all kind of all the, the parts of memory for that. Uh, but today we're talking about a thorny problem called deadlock. Uh, so uh, to demonstrate this, I need five volunteers to come sit around this table. <laughs> So five volunteers, please move up your desks to sit around uh, our table up here. Move our desks? Oh, uh, yes. Well, you'll need chairs to be around this table. Okay, just throw that stuff on the ground. All right. So set the scene. Uh, you, are, you are five eminent philosophers. Uh, and you have sat down to, to dinner. Uh, in front of you, you each have a bowl of rice. Uh, however, this table has been set rather strangely. There is a single chopstick sitting in between each of you. And wanting to be proper philosophers, uh, you, you want to use two chopsticks uh, to, to eat the rice. I'm not just going to and scoop it out uh, with your hands, that just that it wouldn't do. Um, so, uh, you go to eat, and uh, go ahead and, and acquire a chopstick. <laughs> Alright, uh, are any of you able to eat your rice? No. <laughs> are any of you able to get the second chopstick no. that you would need to eat your rice? No. So here we have our philosophers, in all their wisdom, deadlocked and literally starving uh, because they can't get the resources they need uh, to eat, eat the bowl of rice. Uh, and this is a, a classic problem in, in computer science called the dining philosopher's problem. Actually? <laughs> yes, actually. <laughs> and uh, uh, so we have... Uh, Starvation, which is made literal in our dining philosophers, but means uh, one or more thread cannot progress. Thank you very much, philosophers. You've been a great help. Uh, so, there, this dining philosopher's problem we can uh, envision it as if a circle is a philosopher and a triangle is a chopstick. We have our five philosophers, and there is a chopstick in between each one. And we had a situation where each philosopher had picked up. one of the chopsticks, they kind of were the owners of one of the resources in this system, and they were each waiting on another one of the resources. And this was the source uh, of, our, of our deadlock here, that each uh, each agent, each thread, or each philosopher was waiting for another thread to give up uh, uh, a resource. Kim. What's special about number five? I feel like two philosophers have also had this problem. Uh, yes, there's nothing special about five. Uh, it's just, you know, if you're, you're sitting down to dinner with a group of philosophers, maybe there are five. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's <don't> me. <laughs> So, uh, you know, our, our chopsticks here represent 
of resources in our system. And we have two kinds of resources. Preemptible and non preemptible. Preemptible meaning preemptible is it's a resource that the operating system can take away from uh, some running thread. Non preemptible means that. Our operating system must leave that resource with a thread. It can't just take it away. So, in our example here, our chopsticks were non preemptible because once a philosopher picked one up, there was no way to like rip it out of their hands. The, the philosopher was going to have that chopstick until they decided to put it back down. Uh, some examples of preemptible resources would be memory. The operating system is managing the memory, it can give processes memory, it can take memory away from them. A lock would be an example of a non preemptible resource. That at least typically, if a thread acquires a lock, the operating system can't intervene and force the thread to release the lock. The thread only releases the lock when it uh, uh, calls the, the relevant function. Does this make sense so far? Questions on this? So, to go through some examples of uh, ways in which deadlock could occur, uh, we have thread A and thread B. Uh, thread A could acquire log 1. Acquire lock two, release lock two, release lock one, and our thread B does these same steps, but in the other order. And so thread A and thread B, they both acquire their locks, and now they're both waiting for each other to release the first lock they acquire. So thread A holds lock one, is waiting for thread for lock two. Thread B holds lock two, is waiting for lock one. This is what is called recursive locking. So if we um, we kind of have these uh, uh, locks kind of structured in, uh, and threads are acquiring them in different ways. Uh, we can end up with where the threads are waiting for, for locks the other thread has. Questions on this? Uh, we can have uh, in a little bit more, like let's say we don't have this uh, uh, recursive. We have thread A acquires lock one, acquires lock two, thread B acquires uh, lock one and lock two. So this seems like we don't have this uh, recursive locking issue, as if thread A gets lock one, then thread B can't, and thread A can make progress, or vice versa. But if here thread A waits on some condition variable, and here thread B signals some condition variable, we could get into a state where and thread A uses lock 2 to protect the condition variable. So thread A holds lock 1, holds lock 2, and then releases lock 2 while it waits. But thread B can never send the signal to wake it up because thread B would need to acquire lock 1 first. And thread A went to sleep while still holding lock one. This is 
an example of nested waiting. And we, we are, are waiting while still holding on to some resource uh, that will prevent some other thread from ever waking us up. And so our system would just also deadlock, no thread could make progress. Does that make sense? All right. Turns out we don't even need locks in order to uh, end up, or, or at least our threads don't need to be explicitly calling uh, lock and release or condition variables in order to end up in deadlock. Uh, so let's uh, imagine we have some uh, blocking bounded buffer, like the sort of thing that you implemented in lab three, so a pipe. Uh, and we have two of these buffers. So thread A adds to B1 a couple times and then tries to remove from B2. Thread B is putting stuff into B2 and removing from B1. So you can imagine these two threads are using these two different buffers to sort of send work or information back and forth. Can anyone think of a, a circumstance where this, uh, uh, these threads could end up uh, deadlocked? If all of A executes before B executes, like we add a bunch of stuff to B1 and then we wait. Uh, but won't B then be able to run an add to B2, which would let this make progress? So I think I think that I think it's if, if our buffers are empty or one of them is, I think we're going to be okay. So we're we're not going to end up in deadlock because someone will eventually be able to put uh, stuff into a buffer. Uh, Owen, what was the full beforehand? Maybe? Yes, if our buffers are say have space for one more thing. Each of them is almost full. Thread, and they're both both threads are allowing the other thread to consume stuff from the buffer. Thread A adds one, fills it up, and so it's blocked at the second add, waiting for thread B to remove. Thread B fills up B2, and then it's blocked, waiting for someone to remove something from B2. So they both kind of fill them up, and then are waiting for the other one to remove stuff, but they're both blocked because they can't add the second thing. So we can get, get deadlock in these kind of variety of, of ways. And we can actually write down like what are the exact uh, properties of a system that must exist for deadlock to be possible. So we need limited resources of some kind. If our philosophers had had 10,000 chopsticks at their disposal, everyone would have been fine. So some sort of limited resource. Uh, we need to have some kind of resource that we can't preempt. Again, if, if uh, at least one of our philosophers could steal a chopstick from a neighbor, they would have been able to eat, set the chopsticks down, and then other people would have been able to eat. So it's when we can't preempt these resources that we can get into trouble. We also, necessary for deadlock, is some sort of hold and wait behavior, by which I mean you hold, you are waiting for some condition while holding some resource. If you're not, say, not allowed to ever wait while you're holding some resource, then uh, you couldn't have that. You, uh, you have some kind of hold and wait. And the last would be a circular chain of requests. Uh, I now regret erasing my circle of philosophers, but 
if you that there's a uh, an image in the in the notes and you think back, we kind of had this circle of arrows where each philosopher is waiting for a neighbor to let go of a chopstick. And so uh, all four of these conditions are necessary in order to uh, in order for deadlock to occur. Which means that if we can do something to avoid any one of these conditions, we can avoid deadlock. Because deadlock is going to require all four of these uh, conditions to exist. And is there a program um, that just goes through once in a while and looks, like, looks for anything that's in the wash? Uh, absolutely. Uh, it wouldn't typically. Um, so, uh, there, are, there are algorithms for detecting deadlock, uh, and there are also strategies for avoiding deadlock. Um, so, I don't know off the top of my head if, say, Linux has some uh, uh, utility that like, goes through and looks for deadlock threads. Um, uh, but uh, I will get to uh, next time uh, on an algorithm that uh, folks have come up with to actually identify like, when deadlock has happened um, and uh, when you might need to do something about it. Uh, so there are a couple kind of neat uh, ideas that would help our, our philosophers not starve. Uh, so we had, um, well, we did have five chopsticks. Two of them have. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so we had five chopsticks. Uh, anyone have a thought on? So, so one one of these is limited resources. So limited, we just five. Uh, how many chopsticks would we need to add to the table? In order to avoid our, our philosopher's deadline. One. Why one? Because then somebody could get, since there's some one philosopher who will be able to get two chopsticks and finish eating, will then rele hopefully release their chopsticks to their fellow philosophers. <laughs> yes, yeah, so if we add one chopstick in the middle of the table, now even if everyone grabs one, someone can grab a second one, make progress, and then set both chopsticks down. So, adding more resources, that can help avoid, avoid deadlock. Uh, but let's say we're in a, a, a horrible chopstick shortage. Uh, we, we can't add another chopstick. Um, there are still things that we might be able to do uh, uh, to, in order to avoid, um, uh, avoid different uh, of these properties. So, one approach would be if we number the chopsticks. You say this is chopstick one, chopstick two, chopstick three, chopstick four, chopstick five. And we said, all right, philosophers, you always have to grab the smaller numbered chopstick first, which means someone grab chopstick one, someone grab chopstick two, and then three, and then four, but the person between chopstick five and one has to grab chopstick one first, because they always have to grab the smaller one, which means they're never going to take five first, which means the person they're left could get both chopsticks. So put in, in less uh, rice-eating terms, um, you might call this lock order. So some set of resources, you always have to acquire them. Every thread has to acquire them in the same order. So that we can never get this sort of circular chain of requests where everyone has required kind of part of what they need because they can acquire them in, in a different order than other threads.
There's also a way that we can avoid this hold and wait, uh, where if a thread tries to acquire the resources that it needs, uh, if at any point they can't, they'll release whatever resources they're currently holding. So they never wait while still holding the resources. So for our philosophers, I acquire one chopstick, I try to acquire the other, it's not available, I immediately set down the chopstick I had and then try again. I just keep doing that until I can actually get both. But I never spend any time like holding one or waiting for the other. This does have a downside where I, I'm just doing this kind of try over and over, and uh, I might never get a chance to eat if my neighbors keep grabbing one or the other chopstick before I can get both. Uh, uh, but if, um, if we could make acquiring chopsticks an atomic operation, I could wait until both were available and then grab both at the same time. And that would avoid me um, kind of repeatedly grabbing one and having to set it back down. Um, and preemption, if we allow philosophers to steal chopsticks, then we can also avoid avoid that. Uh, but if we're thinking about locks, we probably don't want a thread to be able to like just steal a lock from another thread. <laughs> the whole point of lock is to prevent uh, threads from from interfering with each other. Although you could imagine some set of priorities among threads that were cooperating, where if one thread wanted a lock, it would like cancel the operation that any other thread was doing and would get, get to go ahead. All right, that will be all about deadlock for today. Next time, uh, we'll talk about something called the banker's algorithm, which is uh, a way to, with some knowledge, be able to avoid any possible deadlock. Uh, be working on uh, lab four, lab five, uh, design doc to Thursday. I have office hours tomorrow night as well, and I'll see you Friday. Thanks, Aaron. Thank you. Thank you. I said, nobody knows just how it started. Somebody.